Tara Beatty. I'm a lecturer in social epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine here, and I'm also a member of the STRIVE team and have been for some years now. Um, STRIVE is a six-year international research consortium investigating the social norms and inequalities that drive HIV. STRIVE partners investigate how structural factors create vulnerability and what programs work to tackle them. Research focuses on key upstream determinants, including gender inequality and violence, poor livelihood options, alcohol availability and drinking norms, and stigma and criminalisation. Today's webinar um, is around why, sh why should violence prevention form an essential part of an HIV prevention response for young women. Gender-based violence increases HIV risk, which in turn has marked impact on the, on the continuum of HIV, HIV prevention, treatment and, and care. Um, for this webinar, Dr. Sinead Delaney Moratli, sorry, Sinead if I pronounced that incorrectly, um, adapts her plenary presentation from the South African AIDS Conference, in, um, which was held in June this year in Durban, South Africa. Their participants ranging from USA to local community-based organizations responded to this crystallization of key strive analysis. In addition to her own work on adolescent girls' HIV risk and resilience, Dr. Delaney Moratley syntheses discussions from STRIVE's high-level consultation on violence against women and girls and HIV at the Green Tree 2 retreat um, will be presented. She's Director of Research at WITS RHI. Her focus is on the prevention and control of sexually transmitted infections, including HIV. She has led several international multi-centre trials of new technologies for HIV prevention, including genital herpes treatment and novel microbicides, as well as the FACT001 trial. Thanks, Tara, and good afternoon from Johannesburg to everyone on the line. I'd like to kind of acknowledge the STRIVE team for giving me the opportunity to share with you the presentation uh, that was given at the South African AIDS Conference in Durban in June. I think one of the things to start with is really to acknowledge uh, a young FACT001 participant who was abducted and murdered early on in her, in her participation in the FACT trial. And what happened to her was really important, I think, for highlighting these dual epidemics that exist, particularly when, within the Southern African context and how intertwined they are, but also how important their response is. Um, are going to be for us in responding to the HIV epidemic. So what I'd like to do in the next uh, 30 minutes is talk a little bit about the global burden of HIV and gender-based violence uh, again, amongst adolescent girls and young women, talk about what we know about how uh, gender-based violence particularly increases HIV risk, and how violence also has a marked impact on the continuum of HIV prevention, treatment, and care, and then begin to talk about how we can think about linking program responses for these two epidemics uh, in our setting. So to start with, I think it's important to remind everyone that adolescent girls and young women are a key population in Eastern and Southern Africa when it comes to HIV. In 2013, there were about 2.1 million adolescents who were living with HIV, the majority of them in Sub-Saharan Africa. And adolescent girls and young women are about up to eight times more likely to be living with HIV than boys and young men of the same age. Among those living with HIV, AIDS is now the leading cause of death amongst adolescents in Africa and the second and most common cause of death globally. Uh, and in fact, in terms of UNAIDS estimates, adolescents are the only group in which deaths due to HIV are not, or AIDS are not decreasing, while all other age groups have experienced a decline of about 38% in AIDS-related deaths between 2005 and 2000. 13 as a consequence of increasing coverage of ART. HIV incidence is also highest in adolescent girls and young women aged 15 to 24, as this graphic shows, and about every week 7,000 adolescent girls and young women are infected with HIV. About a third of these infections occur in young women here in South Africa, and this is despite a doubling of people on antiretroviral therapy from 16% in 2008 to 31% in 2012, according to the HSRC report. Another important thing to bear in mind is that uh, adolescents represent a substantial portion of the global population, and prevention of HIV in adolescent girls and young women has become the new priority. Currently, adolescents represent about one-fifth of the world's global population, but it's expected that by 2050, 
Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is projected to have more adolescents than any other region in the world, and this represents an absolute expansion in the population that is susceptible to HIV infection. So if we want to achieve the UNAIDS fast-track targets, we really need to prevent, uh, prioritize prevention in this population. And to address that, uh, we have to really respond to the disproportionate vulnerability of adolescent girls and young women and the drivers of the HIV epidemic in this part of the world. So gender inequalities and gender-based violence are a key reason for HIV-related health disparities observed in young girls and, and women. And women experience multiple overlapping forms of violence at every life stage. This violence includes physical, sexual, and emotional violence from partners and non-partners. And global and regional estimates on violence against women published by WHO show that one in three women worldwide have experienced either physical and or sexual violence by an intimate partner or non-partner in their lifetime. This figure ranges from 27% in the WHO European region to about 46% in the African region. And some of the highest rates of gender-based violence globally are experienced here by women in South Africa. So adolescent girls and young women also experience higher levels of intimate partner violence in their lifetime, with a prevalence of about 30% that's been estimated globally, but there is also significant heterogeneity within regions. And this slide represents data from a study that was conducted about 18 months ago in five cities, six cities um, across, five cities across the world, including Johannesburg, in young people aged 15 to 19. And here you can see that the prevalence of intimate partner violence ranged from 10 to 36%, with the highest levels of violence observed in Johannesburg. Importantly, violence against women has serious consequences for women's health that include fatal and non-fatal injuries, mental health problems, and poor sexual and reproductive health, including HIV. And in this population, we saw intimate partner violence was associated also with substance use, poor sexual and reproductive health outcomes, and mental health. And what this means is an enormous burden for the health system, with even the most conservative estimates suggesting that the national costs of violence against women and girls are in the billions of dollars. Importantly, for the HIV response, young key populations also experience high rates of partner violence and sexual assault. While few data exists about um, adolescents or young uh, key populations in particular, there are indicators that suggest that sex workers uh, experience a lifetime prevalence of any violence between 45 in, the, in about 45 and 70 to 75% of sex workers, and that young trafficked sex workers may experience rape to coerce them to sell sex. With regard to young men who have sex with men, data from Thailand suggests that the first experience um, of sex for young uh, men was forced sex during adolescence with a prevalence of 18%. And when it, in terms of people who inject drugs, a study from the US in 16 to 29 year olds suggested that about 11% of women had experienced sexual assault um, associated with drug use um, in the past three months. So young key populations are also more likely to require sexual assault services, including access to post-exposure prophylaxis. Now I want to talk a little bit about how gender-based violence may increase HIV risk and the evidence that we have uh, around that. So there are a number of methodological challenges that make the interpretation of the observational data difficult, but cohort studies give us some insights into the relationship between violence and subsequent acquisition of um, HIV. And in this meta-analysis, data from cohort studies suggest that violence uh, within intimate partners is associated with an increased risk of HIV and that estimates of the population attributable fraction of incident HIV is in the range of 12 to 22 percent. What we all have also learned is that more uh, severe IPV appears to be associated with a higher HIV risk, and emerging data also suggests that the cumulative effects of multiple forms of violence put women at higher risk. So in this study that was a, con uh, a cohort study conducted in about um, 1,000 women aged 15 to 26 from the Eastern Cape who were HIV negative at baseline and had at least one additional HIV test over two years of follow-up, what we can see is that 23% experienced physical or sexual intimate partner violence, while only 5% reported rape by a non-partner. What this study illustrates is that in addition to a strong association between intimate partner violence and HIV, the study also showed a relationship between levels of inequality within partnerships and HIV. Women who reported low relationship power equity had a much higher risk of HIV infection. 
and women who experience low gender equity were also more likely to experience intimate partner violence. So 29% of women with low equity also experience partner violence versus 22% in the medium or high equity ca ca uh, category. And interestingly, risk of incident HIV was not associated with rape by a non-partner. What this highlights for us is that these data suggest that sexual violence is not the most important risk potentially for HIV and that physical violence, verbal abuse, male controlling behaviors are potentially more important in terms of uh, HIV transmission. So there are a number of direct and indirect pathways that have been proposed uh, to, to explain why violence might increase HIV risk. And the one that is most commonly understood are the direct effects of sexual violence, which may cause trauma in the genital tract. But there is also an understanding that there, are, there may be common underlying risk factors uh, and that gender inequality may put women at risk both for violence but also for HIV. There has been increasing interest in the indirect pathways by which um, um, HIV, uh, by which violence may increase HIV risk, and I'd like to talk a little bit more about those. And another uh, option is also that violence may be an outcome of, un uh, of disclosure of HIV status for many women. So clearly a lot of data exists about the direct mechanisms by which um, HIV um, may be a consequence of rape. There is biological plausibility in terms of genital injury, the frequency potentially of forced sex, the type of sex that may be experienced, as well as the presence of ectopy and the partner viral load that may increase uh, risk of acquisition of HIV. But there is increasing interest in emerging evidence around the basis for um, intimate partner violence leading to um, psychological distress and potentially chronic stress and how this may either influence behaviors or may um, alter um, risk through other unknown or less described pathways. And what we're learning increasingly is about the immunology of violence, that HIV um, is associated with uh, inflammation and um, immune activation, and that genital injury and exposure to HIV as a result of sexual violence can induce inflammation and immune activation. But what we're starting to learn is that it may not be all about uh, sexual violence. And in fact, physical abuse, emotional abuse may be associated with up or down regulation of host genital immunology uh, and immune responses. There, has, there is emerging data that suggests that women who experienced intimate partner violence were at increased risk of acquiring HIV with increasingly severe violence, that higher rates of depression and lo uh, lower T cell function in women uh, have been observed in women who experience chronic abuse, and that in post-traumatic stress disorder, um, is associated with dysregulation of cortisol pathways uh, that may also influence uh, in, uh, immune responses. And this is particularly important when we think about the maturing genital tract of young women. So here we have some intriguing clinical data um, which helps to suggest how immune dysregulation is a plausible mechanism by which violence may influence HIV risk. In this study, um, 47 physically abused women and uh, 27 psychologically abused women were compared with 37 non-abused control women. And the primary aim of the study was really to understand um, how uh, uh, physical violence may uh, compromise the immune system uh, by looking at herpes simplex, uh, the virus that causes cold sores. Uh, in terms of this study, information was collected from women about social democratic demographic characteristics, their lifetime history of victimization, mental health status, and post-traumatic stress disorder. And in addition, salivary samples were collected on two occasions, um, and assessments were made about the ability to neutralize live HSV-1, um, as well as to look at antibody and total IgA responses. And what they found in this study is that physically abused women had the lowest viral virus neutralization significantly below the other two groups. And what you can see in panel one is that result, that HS, uh, the lower um, ability to neutralize um, virus in the physically abused group. In addition, they also looked at uh, hsv one specific antibody measurements, and what they saw was that um, antibody, antibody measurements tended to be lower in physically abused women. But these uh, levels were not directly correlated with virus neutralization 
suggesting that their loss was associated with other antiviral factors. Um, and I think the importance of this data is that they provide us with some insights into the interactions between violence, HIV, and the, the medical interventions that we may need to consider uh, in, in responding to these two ec epidemics. But also it begins to provide some biological plausibility for why not just sexual violence, but a broader range of violence behaviors, including controlling behaviors, may influence susceptibility to HIV. So I want to reflect now on how violence also has an impact on the continuum of care for HIV. And in addition to increasing HIV risk, how violence has, a, has an impact on these uh, care pathways. And what's critical to acknowledge is the growing evidence that violence against women and girls impacts on multiple steps in both the treatment and prevention cascade. So if we reflect on what is known from, from the literature already about violence and the fear of violence, we can see that uh, among studies of pregnant women, anticipated intimate partner violence is associated with a refusal of HIV testing and that stigma and fear of disclosure are major barriers to uptake of PMTCT. And this is data that comes from a systematic review. In addition, male involvement predicts better adherence to um, nevirapine, and physical intimate partner violence lowers uptake of antenatal care, as well as decreases women's breastfeeding, all important aspects of the prevention of mother-to-child transmission. When we look at what we know uh, from studies with HIV-positive women, uh, there is some evidence that anticipated violence lengthens time to linkage to care, and that violence may also decrease antiretroviral uptake, as well as uh, influence poor adherence, um, and that violence has been associated with poor HIV outcomes, including lower CD4 counts uh, and increased uh, opportunistic infections and virological failure. This is particularly important to consider in the context of adolescent girls and young women who we know are already um, hidden within the uh, treatment cascade and already are um, not well managed uh, within HIV services. What has become um, of great interest in, in literally, I think, in the last 12 months has been the impact potentially of um, violence and um, gender inequalities on the HIV prevention cascade and particularly on the uptake of and adherence to uh, PrEP. Um, Despite evidence that oral PrEP works when taken, there are concerns about the potential benefits of oral PrEP for heterosexual women. And uh, even though data from trials um, that have um, shown benefit of PrEP uh, suggest that protective effects may be as high as 80 to 92 percent in those people who use uh, PrEP, there still remain concerns about um, poor adherence um, in, in young women and in particular. And this comes largely from, from two trials, the, the FEMPREP and VOICE trial, where um, adherence levels were less than 30% based on, on drug detection. What is of great interest has been to try and understand why it is that um, young women who are at incredibly high risk for HIV, in fact, were poorly adherent uh, to PrEP. Um, and um, it is, we think that um, it's important uh, to reflect on the context in which they live and the influence that violence and gender inequalities may, uh, may the role that they may play in shaping uptake and adherence to PrEP. So um, emerging evidence over the last year really uh, has shown us um, that male partners influence uptake and use of PrEP in young women. In the VOICE trial, uh, what we saw um, particularly was that male partners' understanding or support of the trial and support of women to use study products had a significant influence on women's use of PrEP. And this was data from the VOICE C study, which was a, an ethnographic study which followed women up uh, in a cohort in Johannesburg. And what we also learned that were that there were concerns about the potential uh, stigma associated with antiretrovirals that led to concealed use of study products and lower adherence and that antiretroviral use um, was perceived by male partners to be associated with HIV illness, um, and that often unintentional disclosure of product use led to relationship conf conflict. What we've also learned from the trials of microbicides is that uh, fear of violence influenced women's decisions to disclose both trial participation and gel use to their partners. 
in the MDP 301, which was conducted in several sites uh, across Southern Africa, what we learned was that male partners, um, particularly in Johannesburg, were perceived as being authoritarian and controlling, uh, and they were often perpetrators of intimate partner violence. And what we've learned from qualitative research from Tanzania was that the fear of violence influenced women's decisions to disclose their participation in gel use, um, and this often led to concealment of gel use. More recently, from the Caprice 004 trial, which evaluated tenofovir gel, women talked about uh, fear of disclosing gel use in trial participation, and interestingly, non-disclosure was associated with greater difficulty of gel use. But by contrast, um, other analyses of their data suggest that disclosure to partners was associated with increases in adherence. So all in all, um, male partners' responses uh, to gel or oral prep use are incredibly important in influencing the way that young women may um, accept and uh, adhere to prevention. What we've also learned from the literature is that um, while PrEP may not be for all young women, um, even uh, similar findings have been observed in studies of, of condom use. So I think one of the important messages from these trials as well is that trials are not real life. Uh, and one of the key differences between these trials and real life is the fact that the products that were being evaluated were products of unknown efficacy. Um, but what we are increasingly learning from, um, um, and importantly from those trials, even though there were a subpopulation of women who struggled to use uh, these products, the majority of women were able to negotiate successfully their use of products. And in some instances, they talked about how these products actually improved communication and their sexual relationships. So we clearly need to understand how we can learn those lessons of successful use and translate them to younger women who may, um, who may be struggling with, with using preventive measures. What's also reassuring is that in real life, what we have learned from um, demonstration projects among men who have sex with men is that many PrEP takers talk about how PrEP has decreased anxiety and increased communication and a sense of self-efficacy, but also sexual pleasure and intimacy in their lives. Um, from sex workers, we've learned that the fear of vi violence may actually be a motivator for PrEP use, and all of these are really important findings from demonstration projects about how we, which may help us to support young women to incorporate oral PrEP into their everyday lives. So lastly, I want to talk about how we might be able to link um, the programmatic responses to HIV and gender-based violence, particularly when thinking about adolescent girls and young women. And I think given the um, significant burdens of HIV, but also violence, um, it's important to understand that um, there is a real rationale for a health sector response to violence. Um, we know that uh, women who experience violence are more likely to seek health services that most women will attend health services at some point in their life, um, and particularly they will seek sexual and reproductive health services, and this is even adolescent girls and young women. And importantly, if healthcare workers know about a history of violence, they can actually give better services to women. They have the potential to identify women in danger before violence, violence escalates. Then they'll be able to provide pr appropriate medical care or psychological care. Uh, which may help reduce the negative consequences of violence, and they may be able to assist survivors to access uh, future help or services or protections, with the ultimate goal that this will lead to improved health outcomes in these women. Um, and in addition, it is a, clearly a human right obligation on the part of health services to respond to, to violence against women. So given the clear rationale, um, and uh, why perhaps do we not see um, the health sector response as clearly as we would like it? And I think the important thing is that, in fact, there is a, a responsibility to respond, and global guidelines have been developed to guide health system responses. Um, these were released by WHO in 2013. Um, but the truth is that, particularly in South Africa, for example, all of the strategies that are supported by the South African government have very little evidence to support their efficacy, and most are focused on a justice and law enforcement approach, which uh, the evidence for which appears limited in resource-rich settings. 
So the most promising interventions, such as victim advocacy and home visitation, uh, very little is known about them in low-income settings, um, and we really need to understand a little bit more um, how to develop, a, to provide a health sector response in low- and middle-income settings. So a recent review that was published in late um, 2014 has given us some insights into what might be appropriate uh, set of interventions in uh, low- and middle-income countries. Um, and I think that previously most of the focus has been on post-violence care and in particular the access to PEP. So uh, broadening our understanding about how violence might increase HIV risk but also is responsible for a number of other health outcomes um, may help frame some of our responses. Uh, in certainly what we know from the evidence is that in high-income countries, the responses that have shown to have benefit um, are those um, have evidence for increasing physical and mental health outcomes um, and have shown, um, but have shown limited evidence for re-victimization. In low- and middle-income countries, um, there has interestingly been an increased emphasis on primary prevention. Um, but these are not part of our, as I said, these are not part of our primary prevention responses in South Africa. And this is surprising given that some of the evidence for these responses really has come from trials that have been conducted in South Africa, like Stepping Stones and the IMAGE trial, and from further afield, uh, like the SASA trial in Uganda. And what these uh, trials have shown is that it is possible to reduce the risk for violence within programmatic timeframes and to, and to lead to some evidence for change. So what does this mean for, for HIV programming? Well, I think um, what has been a really, uh, really interesting is to see the results of a trial that was published by Wagman and colleagues at the end of, uh, in, in the Lancet in January this year. Um, the SHARE trial was a cluster randomized control, control trial of a multi-component intervention that involved several components that you can see here. There was an advocacy component, a, um, a capacity building component, community activism, learning materials were prepared in special events, and they combined community act action to change social norms. They enhanced their HIV counseling responses, and their, a lot of their community mobilization responses were based on SASA, uh, which is an intervention that was evaluated in Uganda um, an approach that has been shown to have impact on violence but not on, on HIV, although the SASA trial had limited power to show that. So the results from the SHARE trial were um, show that provide support for an intervention model that does combine um, violence reduction interventions with HIV uh, interventions. Uh, what you can see in this table is that um, overall there was a, a benefit of the um, of an integrated intimate partner violence and HIV prevention intervention uh, in the population in Rakhai, um, and that exposure to SHARE was also ex associated significantly with reductions in past year intimate partner violence, physical violence, and forced sex as reported by women, um, and was also associated, associated with increases in disclosures of, of sexual, uh, sorry, of HIV results. Interestingly, it wasn't associated with um, changes in, in reported perpetration of violence or risk behavior. Um, and clearly, these promising results require uh, further replication that give us some indications that programmatically it is possible to combine responses to both violence and HIV. So in summary, um, I hope that I've been able to illustrate that HIV and violence against women and girls are widespread, and this is particularly in high prevalence HIV settings that young women are exposed to multiple overlapping forms of violence which increase their risk for HIV. And importantly, I think we're starting to understand that it's not just sexual violence that increases HIV, but a, a range of behaviors, physical, emotional uh, abuse, as well as sexual violence. That it's critically important that the health sector responds both to violence because of the important impact it has on health, um, but also that it may have a significant impact on us achieving our HIV uh, targets and therefore it's important, if possible, to uh, combine responses to both problems. And while the evidence base is small, what we're beginning to see are promising approaches that suggest that it's possible to achieve reductions in both violence and HIV within programmatic timeframes. So I think it's important to remind ourselves that 
as Kofi Annan did in, 10 years ago, that there is no policy for progress more effective than the empowerment of women and girls. And study after study has taught us that no other policy is as likely to raise economic productivity or to reduce infant and maternal mortality. And no other policy is as sure to improve nutrition and promote health. And I'd very much like to acknowledge the contributions of my colleagues at WITS RHI and within the STRIVE Consortium and also the Green Tree 2 participants uh, who definitely contributed to the synthesis. And then perhaps to end with a small plug uh, for a new project which was funded uh, at the start of this month by uh, DFID um, uh, called Empower, which is um, enhancing um, PrEP options for women exposed to risk and is really a project, um, a collaboration that comes out of the STRIVE partnership and a project between the RHI in South Africa, Me Too in Tanzania, the London School, and ICRW, with a specific aim to take some of the lessons that we have learned through the synthesis and to evaluate the feasibility, acceptability, and additional benefits of trying to combine violence and stigma reduction activities and to integrate these into a, an HIV program, which would include oral prep for young women aged 16 to 24. So hopefully in the next two and a half years, we will have some interesting results to share with you. So with that, I'll end, and thank thanks very much for your attention, and happy to take any questions. Hi, Sinead. Thanks so much for that talk. Um, that was extremely interesting. Maybe while we're waiting for people um, to, to think about questions they might have, um, I could start us off. Particularly interested to, to see how the evidence that you presented supports a lot of the, what STRIVE sort of base values are about addressing the upstream drivers, both of violence and of HIV. Um, and I was wondering if you know of any studies that are underway at the moment which look to try and provide further evidence of um, the feasibility of addressing violence and HIV as part of a comprehensive prevention program with, with adolescents? Well, obviously, I've, I've just mentioned um, the study that we're about to start, but the evidence for HIV prevention in Southern Africa, which is a program funded by DFID, has funded three, I think, three, or three additional projects on HIV. Uh, one is focused on adherence in HIV positive adolescents, but there is another one which is um, similarly looking at sort of combining um, different um, approaches to HIV prevention. It's not looking specifically at violence though, so I think um, the EMPOWER project looked specifically at violence and stigma reduction. Th those are the only kind of um, programs that I'm aware of at the moment, but I'd love to hear about more that are ongoing because I think it's going to be incredibly important to build this evidence base, particularly as we're being encouraged to prioritize interventions for young women um, in order to kind of um, achieve these kind of quite ambitious targets of preventing HIV in this population. A uh, question from Megan, Ma Megan Casebolt. Um, she says, you mentioned that many of the programs currently nationally implemented by the South African government are focused on the justice and legal system. Has there been any evidence that combining a health sector response with a justice sector response is effective? So that's a great question. Um, I think um, the sort of comment that was being made is really that in some ways kind of our, our responses have very much focused here on a, on a legal response and that in some ways, the health system has been slow to respond to violence as a problem. Um, at, here at Vits RHI, we are involved in a couple of studies that have started to look at health sector responses to violence. And I think one of the kind of striking um, uh, findings that has emerged uh, kind of even to date is how many people who work within the health system are also victim or, or kind of survivors of violence themselves. And really, there is not... Um, there is not much in the way of sort of systematic guidelines, but also support for those uh, healthcare providers. So what they talk about is the desire to respond, but not necessarily the framework to respond. So I think it would certainly be um, important uh, in thinking about um, the health sector response to be able to strengthen linkages with uh, justice sector responses so that um, the work that is done within the justice uh, system 
um, is important, I think, sort of where there are potentially going to be prosecutions or court cases, but many people that may not be uh, their priority. There are many more people, though, who may still need uh, health care. So I, I think it's important that there is greater kind of synergy between those two two sectors. And um, my sense, at least, is is that uh, if there is evidence, it, it is largely uh, potentially from high income countries. Okay, Maggie Bangza has raised her hand. Um, Maggie, if you could press star seven, and then you can ask your question. Great. Hi. Thank you so much for this really fantastic presentation. Um, I'm looking forward to it being available online because I wasn't able to keep up in keeping notes. Uh, thanks very much for your work on this. I have two questions related to how uh, we might look at integrating some of these ideas into uh, broad platforms that are uh, addressing either through interventions and or through funding uh, some of the work around HIV and violence. The first one is uh, PEPFAR funded programs. And whether you're aware of any successful strategies for bringing this combined focus of HIV and violence reduction uh, more uh, effectively into the PEPFAR platform, whether there are any examples of that, and if not, if you have any ideas for that. And the other one is I was uh, intrigued to hear about the uh, research that's about to uh, become underway in South Africa and in Tanzania funded by DISID. And um, if you have any more information on that, and if not, don't worry about it. I'll just go online and look for it. And it's just to um, emphasize as a second platform that DFID and perhaps other donors as well are increasing their focus on youth generally, not just girls and not just vulnerable young girls, but youth largely because of the demographic um, push and increasing numbers of the youth population. And with DFID and other major donors increasing their attention to youth, there might be more opportunities for bringing in the kind of research and uh, community-based work that you're doing so uh, successfully and importantly in South Africa and other countries. So that, that's just a note on DFID and other donors. But specifically, if you have any thoughts about PEPFAR integration of these ideas, that would be helpful. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for that question. I think the best way to answer that is to say that at this uh, Green Tree 2 meeting, um, representatives from USAID and, and particularly the DREAMS initiative were part of the meeting. And certainly we heard um, how, uh, you know, kind of policies exist around sort of reductions in um, gender-based violence for, for PEPFAR and how that's a key part of, um, of sort of PEPFAR priorities. I think um, what was interesting was particularly the discussion around dreams and how to bring how it was an opportunity to expand the the, the attention to violence within the dreams initiative and this is um, kind of an observation from colleagues from USA that um, currently a lot of the, the the sort of focus of the health sector response particularly is a is a sexual assault response and kind of related to the provision of PEP. Um, but clearly our understanding is that um, a, a health sector response needs to be broader than just responding to sexual assault. And um, so I think there was uh, definitely a lot of interest in how DREAMS might incorporate some of this thinking into their, into their programming. Um, in terms of um, sort of what other projects or funding there is, certainly we've heard of a lot of programs that are uh, particularly funded by USAID that have um, focused definitely on the sort of violence prevention side of things and in particular on sort of uh, gender transformative approaches that are, are focused on empowering um, also men as partners and um, focused on sort of the approaches of changing norms within partnerships in order to improve relationships. Not a lot of them have focused on, on specifically on HIV outcomes, and so I think that's going to be something to kind of pay increasing attention to in the in the coming years. Uh, in terms of sort of your question about DFID, that is um, DFID funded the Evidence for HIV program in Southern Africa. There are eight projects in total that were funded, and the Empower project, which is led by the Tsari Chai, um, and 
and myself um, in particular uh, are one of the grantees. So I'd be happy to, to share more information with you about that program um, if, you, if you would like to contact me after, the, after this webinar. Thanks very much for your response. I appreciate it. There are a number of groups working within the Strive Consortium, and there is a group particularly focused on how structural factors influence um, ART-based treatment and prevention. Um, that is a group led by myself and James Hargreaves, and we have been working on several syntheses to show how not just violence but other structural factors influence uh, the, the prevention and treatment continuum. So I think if there is interest in this topic, uh, it's just to welcome uh, anyone to contact us directly, um, and we'd certainly kind of appreciate feedback on some of this thinking, um, and and also to suggest that with the AIDS conference in Durban in 2016 that we would um, be interested to kind of stimulate some discussion around this topic at the conference. So if there are other people interested in the topic, so please contact us as we as we begin to prepare for that. Okay, we've, we've had one um, one more person has raised their hand. I think we've got time, if, if that's okay with Sinead. It's Lebo Hang Le Seller. Okay, thank you very much, Sinead, for the presentation. Uh, I've been cutting in and out, so I may have missed a bit of, of your talk. But I just wanted to know, were there any links uh, to alcohol, you know, um, maybe the pe from the perpetrators? Uh, are perpetrators maybe drunk at the time of, you know, abusing this young woman? I guess I'm just wondering if there were any links uh, or if anything came out uh, with regards to alcohol. Thank you. Thanks, Level. That's a, that's a very important question. I think um, um, not specifically in this talk, but... Um, I think there are a number of syntheses and uh, systematic reviews that have showed the links between um, alcohol and sexual risk behaviors, and in particular, uh, the effects of uh, alcohol uh, in kind of promoting coercive sex and increasing the frequency of coercive sex. So definitely, there, alcohol is a strong kind of mitigating factor in, in uh, enhancing um, gender-based violence, and, and so kind of with high levels of violence, HIV, and alcohol use is pretty much um, kind of the, the elements of a, you know, kind of, of a syndemic. And following on from that, do we know if there is evidence um, on how alcohol affects HIV susceptibility immu immunologically? So there, there, there have been a number of um, reviews that have looked at different aspects of how alcohol may uh, influence both um, particularly um, HIV uh, disease progression, um, but also kind of um, some analyses looking at how um, alcohol influences sexual behavior and they also, they, uh, and so has been associated with increases in STIs and HIV. I, I think sort of the main arguments are that um, alcohol has a different inhibiting effect and so um, that may increase the risk for STIs and HIV. But interestingly, there's been uh, a lot of new work which has also suggested that in addition to the disinhibiting effect, it also has to do with um, um, proximity to alcohol. So where there are concentrated uh, alcohol venues, um, often that is associated with uh, increased kind of sexual and reproductive health outcomes and um, that some of that is overlaid with kind of experiences of coercive sex. So there has been a fair amount of um, data from um, Cape Town kind of making those linkages. And I, I was wondering if alcohol has been linked to changes sort of in the, re the female reproductive tract, whether it enhances inflammation or downregulation. Well, um, well, I think kind of most of the focus has really been on how alcohol works uh, kind of as a central nervous system drug. So most of what I've looked at has not been kind of on in terms of mucosal effects, but definitely there is um, sort of biological plausibility that it may also kind of have uh, influences on the on, on other kind of systems, including the immune system. Okay. And we know that chronic alcohol abuse is associated with uh, changes in, in immune response. Okay, then. I think that if there aren't any other questions, that this might be a good time to, to, to wrap up. Um, thank you so much, Sinead, um, for a fantastic presentation. Um, and thank you to those who've asked some great questions as well.